Sir Isaac Newton was the 18th century natural philosopher who revolutionized the way we study the natural world. He combined mathematical models together with empirical data in order to draw conclusions about the nature of the objects that surround us. In this video, I'd like to walk you through this method to reveal its most interesting element, an element that I believe is often overlooked when studying Newton. Now, I'm going to distort history a little bit in order to make a philosophical point, so Newton historians be advised. It's the philosophy I'm interested in, not the history. Newton's method was motivated by observation and was twofold, analysis and synthesis. First, he gathered as much information as possible about the phenomena he's trying to elucidate. Let's take the field of inquiry that made him famous as an example, the motion of the planets. Let's put ourselves in our investigator's shoes. You look up at the sky and see tiny white lights. You have no idea what they are. In the hopes of gaining insights, you plot out their motion and infer that they and the Earth are part of a system which revolves around the Sun. That's a great discovery. But what else can you find out about them? Well, in order to even gather more information about the motions of the planets, one has to have an idea as to what even constitutes relevant data concerning the motions of the planets. In other words, what easily apprehensible and unambiguous notions can one use to describe these motions? In this case, the answer is obvious. Velocity, distance, relative positions, radii, spatial temporal notions. Everybody intuitively understands those. So, with the help of numbers, Newton used these simple concepts to paint a very accurate picture of our solar system. And with a description of the solar system in terms of numbers instead of a drawing on a piece of paper, Newton could now see whether there were any regular relationships between these numerical descriptions. For instance, could there be some link between a planet's velocity and its distance from the Sun? As we know, the answer is yes, but this conclusion would not have jumped right off of the page for anyone. Quite on the contrary, in order to discover these mysterious patterns, Newton had to combine, invert, and exponentiate some of his elemental concepts. After relentless hours of head-scratching, a formula popped out. In simple terms, what Newton noticed was that there was an intimate link between three things. The gravitational acceleration a planet has with respect to the Sun, in other words, the acceleration preventing it from flying off into space in a straight line, the planet's distance from the Sun, and some property of the planet itself. And what could that property be? Well, like any good scientist, Newton tried to see whether this mathematical model he constructed applied to any other scientific domain. Lo and behold, it did. His equations could equally be applied to describe the motions of the moon and of terrestrial objects like a ball falling from a tower, and even the tides. Therefore, this mysterious property Newton needed to complete his picture was merely the gravitational mass of the object, a property well understood here on Earth. This is where the synthesis element of his method comes out. By seeing that all these vastly different phenomena can be accurately modeled by a single governing formula, one can infer that the objects exhibiting these phenomena have a similar property the property that causes the phenomena. For example, one day you may be walking along a street and see an apple fall from a tree. Moments later, you see someone drop an egg. Now, it may seem obvious to you that both objects fell towards the Earth for the same reason. They are attracted to the Earth. However, it is quite a different claim to posit the existence of some property inherent in both the egg and the apple, which explains their falling. Mass isn't something you can actually observe. Sure, you can feel the weight of an apple, but that is not its mass. That is caused by its mass, so we say. And now, since Newton proves that those spots in the heavens behave according to the exact same mathematical model as the egg and the apple, he can say that what you thought were gods or heavenly spirits are in fact made up of the same things you and I are. Now, this type of method of inferring the existence of some property based on a constructed mathematical model occurs everywhere in science today. We can look at personality types in this way. Psychologists observe that people's behaviors vary in striking ways. Some prefer staying home to read, while others love going out with friends and partying. So they posit the existence of personalities, the property of a human being. They then test to see whether these properties in fact exist by building questionnaires designed to assess and measure intuitive notions associated with personality. Where Newton broke down the motions of the planets into velocities and relative positions, psychologists on their end developed sets of questions which we intuitively know will be answered by a certain type of person in a certain way. For example, it's clear that if introversion is a property of a person, that person will answer yes to all or most of the following questions. Do you avoid contact with others? Do you have trouble making friends? Are you generally quiet? While extroverts will answer negatively. Indeed, if each person gave different answers to each of these questions, it would tell us that our intuitive notion of introversion and extroversion is mistaken. Just as would be the case for our notion of mass if the celestial and terrestrial bodies did not conform to the same mathematical model. 
In the case of personality, to obtain more precise results, psychologists will then quantify the answers to these questions, mostly agree, somewhat agree, neutral, etc., and generate your personality profile. Political science follows a similar methodology. How do we assess the level of democracy in a given nation? We draw up a list of criteria we know intuitively to be indicative of democracy. The more you meet those criteria, the more you are democratic. Now we can see that as I move from example to example, from Newton's theory to personality traits to democraticness, the claim that these things are a property of something gets more and more tenuous. After all, we can easily imagine that mass is a property of an apple, but it seems slightly odd to say that a state has a property of democraticness. I mean, a state isn't really a thing, like an apple or an egg. To me, it seems like these examples diverge in two ways. First, the intuitive elemental concepts they deal with become more and more ambiguous. We readily understand notions of distance and speed, but for extroversion and introversion, it seems like disagreements are likely to arise, even more so for the concept of democracy. Second, because of this first difficulty, it becomes quite hard to quantify these notions, making predictions difficult and the theory uncertain. Anyways, I hope this video gave you some food for thought. If you ever complain that the mathematics you learned in 12th grade were useless in day-to-day -day life, consider this. The reason that we know that planets are things is because of math. Math can tell us that a thing is. Now that we're on the same page about how we infer properties of objects based on their fitting a mathematical model, in other words, based on the regularity of their behaviors, in the next video, I will discuss how David Hume came around to annihilate any such conceptions.